Dobré odpoledne, dámy a pánové, já bych vás chtěl... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Michael Mars, the president of the Black Writers Festival, welcome to the reading of two prominent Czech authors, David Zabranský and Jan Němec. First, I'd like to ask David Zabranský to come on the stage. Hello, thank you very much. And now we should actually hear a brief introduction of you. Okay. So I guess I'm going to do this. David Zabransky is a prominent Czech author since 2006. His first book won the Magnesia Litera. And recently, he drew attention by two novels, On the Far Side of the Alps, which he's going to read from today, and Logos. That's his last novel. He's not going to read from it today, but we're going to talk about it. Apart from novels, he also writes theater plays and opinion pieces in media. So thank you very much for coming to his reading. And before the reading itself, we're going to have a brief conversation. I have a couple of questions for David. Then I'm going to ask him to read from his book On the Far Side of the Alps. And uh, after that, you'll have a chance to ask questions. Particularly the last two novels have been discussed broadly, and uh, I assume that you'll be interested to ask him questions. My first question is, let me start right at the end of your novel, Logos. I guess you're trying to just make the point by saying that the novel was written in Athens. The two novels seem to be complementing each other. The one about the Alps is more about Czech-German relations or Central Europe, while Logos explores world events over the past few years in general. Now, the fact that you wrote it in Athens, was it significant? Did you need to take a step back uh, to be able to view things from a different than a Czech perspective? Well, a brief answer would be yes, but let me elaborate. I came to Athens for the first time 13 years ago, and uh, I experienced something unique, something that I had not experienced before, and that was a home found. It has really nothing to do with liking it. It was simply a very strong, powerful, emotional experience for me. And I thought, uh, as, I was, as I was starting my fourth decade, I'll try and step on my other foot, not just on so, so that I would be able to actually stand on both feet. So I figured I'm um, in the middle of my life, and uh, that's where I found home. It has nothing to do with tourism at all. Uh, I wasn't really uh, following the discussions at the festival, uh, the topic of which is that beauty saves the world. Well, it's obvious that beauty will not save the world, at least now and just being an escapist or an artistic by locking yourself up with beauty or extolling it from an ivory tire and then did it appear like Michel Montaigne with essays 20 years later, well, that's not going to save the world. I think that believing that beauty is going to save the world is tourism. Uh, particularly in a way that hunting beauty is called tourism. I think beauty is a plundered common good. Perhaps we should step back from beauty for a little bit, stop messing with it so that it could reinstate itself. So I didn't go there because I liked it aesthetically. I didn't go there as a tourist. I simply felt that this was the only country that I wanted to have with my life apart from the Czech Republic. 
So I wrote it perhaps capriciously at the end of the book. I'm sure that a lot of people are going to feel annoyed by it, saying, well, why does Zabransky have to feel the need to actually add to the book that he had written it in Athens? I simply couldn't help myself. Athens were a miracle for me, and I felt the need to write down that I had written the book there. So yes, to go back to your question, it certainly changed my view of Central and European history. When I looked at the narrator of the novel, in Logos, there is a particularly important period of time when the pro protagonists are coming to Athens while the crisis was speaking, and I was wondering whether that may, whether that was important for you. We're walking on thin ice here. It's a very tricky subject. Berliners might feel the need to go to Greece to look for crisis and look for the new Berlin. Uh, everybody in Athens uh, is upset by being called the new Berlin, but then they're also upset that Berlin is being called new Athens. So I didn't go there in a romantic search of the authentic. Again, the authentic is a counterprodu counterproductive and did abused term. Simply have to say that I was struck by Athens and I had to stay. And it wasn't because of the crisis, I don't know, but it was the hills. I felt like I was walking through landscape. I didn't feel like I was in a metropolis, although five million people lived there, so it is a tremendously large city. But especially if you go back into the history of Athens and you realize that it was basically a bunch of villages being joined together, then you realize that it really is a landscape scattered with villages and uh, it really changed my life. There was another interesting point that you made in relation to Berlin or New Berlin. In Logos you actually speak of the New Berlin but you place it else, elsewhere. If we look back into the 19th century, when Germany wanted to present itself uh, as somebody who has inherited ancient Greece and they were trying to follow up on it, including the sculptures and uh, the large squares. Now, if Athens are being called the New Berlin, it's an imitation in reverse, which is fascinating, isn't it? Well, the term Berlin is quite fascinating. I say that I come from Letna in Prague because I think that Letna is the copy of Berlin in Prague. Berlin is a symbol. We have to work with mental shorthand. I think everybody knows what you mean when you say Berlin. And I was working with that term on purpose. In Logos, I'm basically building a new Berlin. I don't know if I'm doing, doing a good job or a bad job, but I'm trying to take the slow down world or the fragility of it uh, to the extreme. I mean, here, whenever I come to Berlin, I have a feeling that people are walking so slowly. It just feels that I'm in a zoo uh, where there are some endangered species like um, sloths. So I don't know, if you really started to crochet, if we really started to grow carrots in the soil, and then I moved out to Syria. Your novel tries to capture a paradigm change from the fall of the Berlin Wall to the building of the new walls. The old wall had fallen, but in your new novel, the walls are being built elsewhere than we might imagine, but it does deal with the issue of a divided society. If you compare your Czech experience and your Greek experience, is the division in the society comparable or is our society as divided as commentators want to say? Well, I wanted to take at least two seconds to think how I'm going to reply to this. I'm having such a hard time saying this because it is such a cliche, but yeah, clearly the society is beep. I don't want to say that word. Okay, divided. The Greeks are champions 
in being divided. If you look at their history from uh, their independence in 1830 onwards, it has always been split into the left and the right, and then you have juntas and so forth. So it is a very divided society. We started speaking about commentators. Commentators are saying that Greece was, in fact, the first one that had fallen back on to the regime that we were used to before the populist power, before the populist parties took power. So after the victory of new democracy, a traditional party on the political right, things normalized again. So the Greeks might have been might have been the first ones to jump on uh, the populism wagon, and they are also the first ones that have fallen off of it. Yes, populism is strong there. Yes, division is still there, but the populists don't have free reign anymore. What about the past? Uh, in uh, On the far side of the Alps, we feel resentiments stemming from the past between the Czechs and the Germans. What about the role of the ancient Greek past? Do nationalists uh, tap into it and feed the populist culture? Yes, it is being used perhaps more appropriately by the current left, radical left. The radical right uses it as well. It's interesting how they how they try to build up grassroots democracy. Of course, people say that Syriza was a wasted opportunity, but search of democracy is something that is very present in the Greek society. And of course, Syriza pointed to it. So the attempt at answering basic questions about governance, how governance could be held in as many popular hands as possible. It's a difficult question to answer, by the way. Slavoj Žižek says that populism only works up to a point, and then it becomes obvious that majority decision making leads to mistakes and we are really in a, uh, we're really stuck in a, a deadlock greek uh, the greeks are so anyway are you a pessimist or an optimist when it comes to how the world is going to develop further you're talking about uh, the period after 1989 in greece in logos and uh, you say that Fukuyama became famous by coining a crisis and then it took him 20 years to explain what the crisis was. But the thesis was actually quite optimistic that liberalism is going to reign supreme all over the world. And now we see the opposite. Uh, Anti-liberals are seizing power and uh, the gap is being widened and deepened because liberals simply are incapable of understanding why anti-liberals are seizing power. What do you think about that? Well, basically, all I do these days is sit at home and read. And uh, if you do the math, you can't really be an optimist. Our societies are stuck. So, of course, things are not looking rosy, that's for sure. I don't know what else to, to, to say about that. So, no, I'm, I'm not entirely an optimist. But that said, I think that it's time for action. We need to take steps. And, you know, whether we like it or not, beauty is not going to save the world. Technology is not going to save the world. Uh, geoengineering is not. Bioengineering is not going to save the world. Revolution might. Well, but I guess that revolution is not going to be democratic. Uh, we don't have any answers for that. No, answers are just not available. I think we live in times, okay, well, several times throughout history, there were times when we were saying, well, there are no answers. I think we are on a brink of a planetary crisis and we're really running out of answers genuinely, perhaps, for the first time. Well, it's not very optimistic, but I do agree with you, by the way. And before I let you read from your novel on the far side of the Alps, I wanted to ask you about tourism. You spoke very sharply against tourism. 
but tourism seems to be related to brands and logos. So I was wondering whether tourism is also related to our obsession with brands. You simply go to some places because they are a brand and they make you a brand or belong to a brand. I agree. Searching for beauty and searching for brands is perhaps in the background of this. Perhaps we shouldn't be running after beauty and brands. It's just my two cents uh, rather than a warning. So thank you very much. And uh, would you mind reading us from your novel? Well, originally, I thought I was going to read something different. But then I was told that I need to read something that has been translated into English. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, the book is called On the Far Side of the Alps. It came out in 2017. I wrote it in Bromov which was another intense experience, and this is what I wrote. My Sylvian has allegedly never been to Europe, though that information is almost 10 years out of date. By pure coincidence, she came from southeastern Chad, having been born in a village about 50 kilometers from Amtiman. She shook her head in disbelief when I told her my wife was working in Amtiman. I gathered that she'd completed her schooling at least the basics with some simple maths and above all languages. So far as I can tell, the whole of Africa stands or falls by broken English, on the whole falls, the skeptic would say. The axis of her life was humanitarian aid and a bit like work and holidays in our own case. Kind people from various NGOs used to feed her and move her on, like passing the parcel, always crouching and wearing helmets because of the constant swish of bullets and machetes over their heads, until finally they got hurt all the way to Njamina. From there, there was and would be no further for her to go. And she also only deliver parcels on the Sylvian type to inland destinations. Meanwhile, she'd grown from a five-year-old little sprog into a 20-year-old gazelle. That's how old she has been when I met her. She'd been sitting by the pool on the day Maria left. I'd taken my work on the, uh, to the pool with me, and I opened my browser and went to Facebook, where I put like a against Maria's photo of the sunrise. It already had 40 likes, including mainly fingers crossed emojis and stickers, only a minimum of words. It was hard to believe that most of Maria's friends were doctors, many of them extremely capable and overworked. At that moment, I remembered Sylvian. I wondered what she'd say to Maria's Facebook page. I wondered what she'd make of the fact that my wife was a top-flight doctor and how that information would sit with all the squawks and cave paintings on her Facebook wall. I wondered if the doctors at the mission with Sylvian also spoke in smileys and squawks when they were vaccinating her or if they'd adopted a different demeanor with her. I'd have like to know if Sylvian would hold all those smileys against my wife or if uh, she would be more at ease. Maybe uh, she'd like the restraint of it? Did she know we believe we know, namely, that severity and primness lead straight to Hitler? Did she know that the whole planet's only hope was humor and a lack of ostentation? Might she have agreed? And was Sylvian even living on the same planet? I opened a new tab in Chrome. I googled porn. I was surprised that I uh, didn't know of the path the address of any specific porn site. It wasn't that I'd never jerked off uh, over porn before, but uh, here was evidence that it was only on an extremely rare occurrence. Uh, the sex I had with Maria was adequate. I, mm, I have to say that Maria simply appealed to me, and perhaps that's all there is to it. The first link to come up was PornTube.com. I clicked on Ebony. If I'd scrolled through anything on my rare visits to porn sites, then it was this sector of the spectrum. But Sylvian had changed all that. She had become my gateway to Africa, the undergrowth that I decided to plunge my clean hands into. What I found as I clicked through Ebony was disappointment. By far, the majority were more American. You could see that straight away. They were fat, covered in tattoos, pretty rotten overall, bad teeth, and the like. 
lost causes. Since taking their first breath and opening their eyes, it must have been obvious to them that their lives would end up on crack and in porn. Their country is now led blithely by Donald Trump, which strikes me as so much more fitting than if it were still Obama. The section contained no one like Sylviane. She was too proud for anything of the sort. And anyway, with her figure, she ought to end up on the catwalk, not on porn sites, I mused as I st stared at her ebony competitors. Still no one by the pool. The old black waiter popped up out of the restaurant to see if I wanted to order anything. I had an iced tea, uh, slept, snapped my laptop shut, shut and dived into the water. The water was pleasantly cool and I sank my head down beneath the third surface. Perhaps there was some connection between my first thinking seriously about her there in the pool with my head under water and the dawning that we might have more in common than I thought. Whatever the case, it was then that I told myself I didn't have to be just thinking about her, but that I could try to find her and get talking to her. There was nothing wrong in that. We did all come forth from the same water. I let my trunks dry off a bit and headed to the restaurant. There was a handful of people there, late breakfast, NGOs holding meetings, laptops, name tags, and in went I and après moi a bit of deluge. Hi, is Sylvian around? I asked the black guy. This was my first ever foray into colonial terrain. I didn't know what tone to adopt. I had no idea how far the times had progressed over the last century. I had no idea about anything at all. I was wondering if my question was or would be a bit beyond just ordering a Merinda. No, she isn't. Sorry. She's only, she only does Mondays. Well, is there anything else I can do for you? He asked. I never lost sight of the fact that the hotel was part of a French chain, not some African shambles. On the other hand, I told myself that Paris was in many respects quite far away. I'd like her company, I said outright, and I was uh, hoping that he won't answer. She doesn't own a company. She's quite poor. A Czech would have said something like that. But no, this man had other jobs here on earth than trying to be funny. Of course, I'll give her a call, he replied without hesitation. I thought that his expression wasn't just utterly business-like, but also had a tiny spark of contempt. I'd seen the light from waiters in Prague. I'm not any fat old pig, I told him. The sentence came out unbidden, unchecked. He pretended not to have heard. He phoned her and said she'd be here in 20 minutes. Please tell her to bring her swimming things, I added quickly. He put his hand over the mouthpiece and said, Sylvian isn't permitted to go to the pool. She only works in the restaurant or the guest rooms. Just give her permission, I replied. I'd like to have a swim with her, nothing else. Otherwise, the deal's off. He removed his hand and said something in their language. I could imagine the drift. Again, I knew the same thing from Prague, where it had happened often. Yeah, they, there they had no inkling that my understanding of Czech was quite good. Those were awkward moments. In 20 minutes, sir, he said. By the pool, he added. I went to spend the 20 minutes reading up on the history of child Africa and the world on Wikipedia. Sylvian was wearing a white top tucked into her belt and frayed shorts. Both styled our way. The net effect was sexy, but sexy in thoroughly Western terms. The color of her skin was an added bonus. This was a Western girl painted black. I had no idea if she'd change in the kitchen or if she'd come in off the street like that. According to Wikipedia, there was a 50% chance that she'd be a Muslim, 20% that she'd be Christian. From her name and a I'd have bet on the lower figure. I couldn't imagine in any case she might make for it to tell you with Islam. Christian, right? I asked after she sat down. My name's Matthias. I'm German and I'd like to have a chat with you, I said quickly, because that was what mattered most. 
so that she does, doesn't get thinking I was just another fat old pig. She nodded. And a swim, right? My friend told me. I do realize I'm breaking the rules on your account, don't you? Yes, I'm sorry, I said, realizing that we ought to settle on her fee right then. How much, I asked, for a chat and a swim, two hours? Two hundred dollars and two hundred thousand Chadian francs. Okay. And I reached straight for the wallet. I wanted to prove to her that I wasn't any kind of a fat old pig. Here, take it. Carefully, she folded the notes away into the little purse she'd taken from the front pocket of her shorts. Seconds later, I watched her as her beautiful long fingers returned the purse in the pocket. She was turning me on. I had to cross my legs as I sat there on the lounge. There was a lot of Maria about her. She was a Maria with no Heidelberg, a Maria with no problems or different problems. This was a proto-Maria, a Maria from Palermo, not Stuttgart. Her fingers slip, slipping into the tight slit in her shorts. All this was so killingly attractive, so killingly sexy, so killingly European. Would you mind taking your top off, I asked. Let's go and have that swim. I can't swim, she countered. Never mind, we can go in anyway. The pool's only a waist deep. You can just potter about in it. I sensed her flinch, but at the same time I became aware of how just, just how incredible her palm was. Wait, she said, and started to undress. Super, wow, I said, as that simple gesture spread out before my eyes her flood of smooth, healthy brown skin. Her breasts in a tiny cream-colored bikini were firm and bigger than I had been expecting. Her stomach, legs, chest all merged into a single pliant shade, utterly uncomplicated and timeless, a genuine minimalist design. Her nose had a tiny piercing, a discreet little ring that did nothing to upset the symmetry of her face. Her dark eyes, those arching eyebrows, set high and gradually Needing, receiving forehead, her hair down to her breasts woven into the plaits as she shrug out of the tight neck hole and her hair flopped down her back neck. I felt another violent twitching between my legs. Even, the, even her bottom was perfect, firm and with not a hint of cellulitis. However, my attention was actually focused on her nostrils. As she stipped her head back and uh, was tussling her top and her hair, she gave me a good view inside them. These nostrils were absolutely calm, expectant, as if she wasn't even breathing. Today, I'd say that at times she and her nostrils put me in, mi put me in mind of the quietest laptop filled with an SSD drive, um, a thoroughly antithetical life form. You're beautiful, I said truthfully, as she stood before me in her swimwear, waiting for that what would come next. You're turning me on, I added, pointing toward my groin. Thanks, she said, showing not at the slightest interest. Let's go. She turned her back on me and set off slowly toward the water. As she walked, she had her head angled toward the restaurant, checking whether at the last minute someone might not start shouting at her and chasing her off. Thank you. Thank you very much for that extract, and uh, I suppose we could have a Q&A and uh, give the opportunity to the audience to ask questions. We have a microphone, so if you have any questions, please uh, ask and speak into the microphone. Mm. Over there, uh, a lady in the last row. Uh, just uh, please move the mic a bit closer to your mouth. Can you hear us, me? I cannot. Uh, respond to the extract really even though it was beautiful but i would like to respond to the first remark about beauty beauty doesn't exist beauty doesn't exist as such 
or what we consider to be beauty. And uh, I would like to quote the Old Testament. He turned around and said, it is good. Beauty doesn't exist, but uh, what is good is above beauty. Would you like to respond to this? I don't uh, think I need to respond to that. That's true. Goodness exists. Another question? Thank you. Hello, thank you for, uh, for this beautiful extract. Uh, coincidentally, I'm reading your book, and I was reading this extract yesterday, so it was nice to hear it from you. My question is, there are so many historical historic references um, also to the German society, uh, the Nazi trauma, uh, the development in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, how long does it take for you to do the research uh, before you start uh, writing the book? Uh, just a very practical question. Uh, thank you. That's a really good question. Uh, before that, I wrote a book about the history of Czechoslovakia, or at least I thought so. And so I was looking for some information for that book, and it was difficult to get rid of all this information. So I opened uh, the doors of my conscience, uh, cons uh, consciousness, and. Um, there is this critic of my book. I can't remember his name. Uh, well, he lives in England. And he said it's a terrible fascist novel, but this person knows Germany very well. Well, I spent two hours in Germany before that. Uh, so it's actually a compliment uh, uh, that I was able to imagine Germany uh, so truly. Usefully. So uh, all this research, uh, I think na nowadays when we have uh, Wikipedia, uh, the fact that all this information is uh, cut and pasted into books, that's not my method. That would be something that I would uh, not like, even though this uh, trend is apparent in Czech literature. But it is not my way of writing. So the research, the preparation, well, I'm now writing about Kuciak's murder in Slovakia, and they are asking me, have you heard about this new piece of information? And I always answer, no, I don't want to, because I would like to use my own imagination. And this doesn't concern only Slovakia, but also other countries. I, I'm not an investigative reporter. I'm not a chronicle. I believe in the power of imagination. So I think pe people can, uh, or creative people can actually invent reality in a much more truthful way. So I don't know whether Germany is as I had described it, but I can be as convincing as to make people believe that Germany uh, looks like this. Maybe this is the beauty, isn't it? Well, I'm really not into copying <laughs> Wikipedia. This is interesting, because recently I've, I've been doing uh, some research about Stephen Crane's Red Badge of uh, Courage uh, that he wrote without actually knowing uh, anything about the, the, or living through the war. It's a very brutal war, um, as he describes it. And he wasn't there. He wasn't there in the war because he was too young. And then he became a war correspondent and he wrote reports about what he really saw with his own uh, eyes. And he was criticized that it wasn't uh, truthful enough or believable. Yeah, uh, that, that's the power of imagination. So hopefully I answered your question. 
Well, the book uh, takes place in the times that we all know, it, the immigrant crisis. Uh, again, it's a term that I wouldn't like to use. It's not a crisis, but we have to, uh, we cannot criticize every word, every expression that uh, we need to go on speaking. We have to work with what we have at hand. Of course, all the terms are are insufficient, imprecise, but we have to speak and uh, ideally act. Uh, getting back to beauty won't save the world, uh, even geoengineering won't save the world. Well, what is going to save the world? It won't be beauty. Maybe imagination? Uh, I don't think so. I believe revolution sounds a bit flat and superficial, but uh, it should be a, a revolution in society, and I think capitalism uh, is uh, something that stands at the center of it. And getting back to Fukuyama, I think capitalism is the big problem there. It's uh, If we look at China, again, the problem uh, is uh, capitalism, something that is blocking change. Do we have any other questions over there? Again? As I said, I'm reading the book right now, so I have another question. You mentioned work, family, and techno as uh, main elements of uh, Matthias's life, and I would add sex. And I think this is uh, something that covers the whole book. Actually, Clemens, Matthias, uh, uh, all the characters actually think about sex all the time. And you said, uh, you also said it in the uh, extract that we all come from the same water, and sex is recurrent in the book. It's not a pornographic book, but uh, sex is one of the main elements of it. Is it intentional or is it something that is intended to provoke readers or since we came from the same water, we all should uh, have sex uh, to have progenity? Well, I mentioned uh, Slavoj Žižek, uh, one of my favorite uh, thinkers, even though the left doesn't like him anymore uh, for some of his um, uh, thoughts. Uh, but now he published uh, a book called Sex and the Absolute, so maybe there you would find some answers why sex is so important. Uh, even, and Zizek is going back um, uh, to spiritual thinking, um, but he also finds something metaphysical in sex. I haven't read the whole book yet um, because uh, it's quite uh, difficult to read, but uh, maybe that's where some answers can be found. But it's the writing itself that led me to, to this. Actually, uh, when we mention metaphysics, uh, the uh, main character is reading uh, Aristotle's metaphysics. Yes, so that's just what happens in the book. I can't see any raised hands. Ah, still, we do have a question here. Can you hear me? I can ask a question in English. Yeah. Good. Um, thank you for your thoughts. I'm, I'm wondering, um, you say that we're approaching a time when globally we're running out of answers. Hmm. What do you see as the role of the writer, the artist, your role um, in, in your creative practice in hmm. addressing that? Hmm. How, how do we go about that? Thank you. It's a wonderful question. I should begin on Czech. We can continue in Czech because we have interpreting. I don't know why I'm getting back to Slavoj Žižek all the time. Uh, I suppose you've seen uh, the Peterson Žižek famous debate. 
at least there, in, uh, when we saw those two great personalities, you could uh, really see it that even those two giants who were trying to answer some questions when were they facing each other, you could really see the powerful eruption of the Krakatau that uh, the answers are simply lacking. We have just two people facing each other and they are trying to say something to keep the decorum, but once you have those two particles together, the message is we have no answer. And what is the role of uh, the artist? Well, that sounds too proud perhaps, but of an author, I think it's palliative care really. Once we're out of technologies, once we have a blackout, which is probably something that we ought to expect, we will simply have to <laughs> take this palliative care and uh, start reading again. That's how I see it. Or perhaps art should um, um, broaden our horizons. That's the objective of art. And in literature, we have the opportunity to get ready for the future. Also, Hollywood could do that. But paper is uh, becoming more uh, stronger and stronger. Well, I love Kindle actually, but so it's not necessarily just a paper, but uh, the written word, and Hollywood might uh, tire out with, uh, mm, I think books are basically something technologically simple, and also the oral culture will probably uh, see a revival. So palliative care plus broadening horizons. This is the preparation for what could be coming, because uh, the novel is the, pos uh, the um, art of the possible, the preparation for what is possible. We certainly should expect change. Nobody is doubting that nowadays. <coughs> Well, uh, of course, there are still people who doubt it, maybe, but yes. Thank you. And do we have another question? If it isn't the case, then I would like to thank David Zabransky for his reading, for his brilliant answers, and for visiting the Prague Writers Festival. David Zabransky.